The Primist presents How the Sahara Desert Turned from Ocean to Desert. If you pay attention to the Sahara to the south, you will see lush vegetation. But in the north, things are very different, and there are many other countries there as well. You can see miles and miles of dune formations in the world's largest desert called the Sahara. People living in the Sahara, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea are all near the Atlantic Ocean. Then there is the Sahel, which is a desert. Another thing that makes up the landscape is a mountain, a flat area, a plain with sand and gravel, a salt flat, basins, and depressions. New research in the Bulletin of the American Museum of Natural History talks about the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which took place 50 to 100 million years ago, in the area where the Sahara Desert is now. The author of the paper went into great detail about the seaway. In comparison to animals today, the animals that lived there were huge. Recreating extinct animals from fossils found in northern Mali found when there was an old river. In the past, some of the world's largest catfish and sea snakes lived in the Sahara Desert. It was 50 meters deep on its best days and covered 3,000 square kilometers of land. That land is now known as the world's largest desert. The fossil-rich sea silt it left behind helped the scientists who wrote about the findings piece together a picture of a place full of life from the fossils they found. People who led the study said that between 150 years ago, northern Mali looked a lot like modern Puerto Rico, which is very dry and full of boulders. There were many mollusks and early mangroves lit up by the sun. The geological units were officially named by the researchers. This was the first time the area was shown on a geological map. Over the 50 million years that the sea has been around, it showed how it ebbed and flowed. They also learned more about the KPG boundary, which is a geophysical marker for one of Earth's five major extinction events, during which the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. As there were 1.6 million catfish, 12.3 million sea snakes, and 1.2 million pycnodonts, O'Leary and the other scientists came up with the idea that the creatures were getting bigger during the late Cretaceous, early Paleogene times. Island gigantism is a topic evolutionary scientists have talked about for a long time. It could be because creatures on small islands have more resources or fewer predators. Or it could be a combination of both. Do you see whales having fun on the sand of the Sahara? However, there is evidence that the whale's relatives used to swim in the hot African desert. The scientists walked their camels into a valley in Egypt in 1902. But there were whale bones in this dark valley. There were bones in some of the skeletons as thick as bonfire logs, but not all of them. These long-dead whales had footprints on them that gave us a clue. In the past, scientists have long thought that whales were animal species that lived on land and then moved into the water, giving up their four legs. For 55 million years, paleontologists believed that the first whales lived near the sea. They were hunter-gatherers who looked for food. Before that, they ate dead fish near the coast. Then they moved on to hunt for food in the shallows, wading deeper as they did so. Because they no longer had to hold their whole bodies up at sea, some got bigger, with their backbones getting longer and their rib cages getting bigger. About 250 million years ago, the Tethys Sea broke up the Laurasian and Gondwanan supercontinents into two separate pieces. It happened when the African and Eurasian plates hit each other. This caused the Alps and Himalayas to be formed, but it closed off the Tethys Sea. As the leaves moved, the sea got smaller and smaller until it was just a few feet wide. Around 7 to 11 million years ago, the Arabian Peninsula replaced the western arm of the Tethys Sea. This caused much of Africa to become arid. Land, which doesn't reflect as much sunlight, took the place of water, which changed how much rain fell. This made the desert green and made it more aware of the tilt of the earth. If we look back at history, there has been more energy coming from the sun in the West African monsoon season than at any other time. African humid periods happen when there is more rain in North Africa. This is because there is more rain in these times. The land gets more plants, rivers, and lakes. When something happened between 8,000 and 4,500 years ago, it was not what anyone thought. The change from humid to dry occurred much faster in some places than could be explained by orbital precision alone. This led to the Sahara Desert as we know it today. As he looked over the archaeological and environmental data, David Wright told us what happened next. 
he mostly looked at sediment cores and pollen records, all dated simultaneously. He found a pattern in the archaeological record that showed people with their tamed animals. There was also a big change in the types and varieties of plants. People hopped from meadow to meadow with goats and cattle and turned everything into brush and desert in their wake. This led them to think that they were reducing the amount of moisture in the air by overgrazing the grass. You already know that plants release water, creating clouds and improving albedo. This may have led to the end of the human race. Faster than orbital changes can account for, these nomadic nomads may have also used fire as a land management tool, which would have slowed down the rate at which the desert took hold. So, in short, around 3.5 million square miles of northern Africa used to be green, which attracted animals like hippos, antelopes, elephants, and aurochs, the first domesticated cattle. They ate the lush grass and bushes, and this green paradise has been gone for a long time now. But will it ever return? If you like this video, do give a thumbs up to this video. And also, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more exciting videos like this. Till next time, peace!